So uh, let us start uh, with a couple of introductions. So uh, I'm Helen Pethybridge. I'm the MD and coach at Action Coach Chilterns based in High Wycombe, Buckinghamshire. And uh, I've come to this after a, a quite extensive career in uh, HR business partnering with international FMCG type businesses. So um, what I'm bringing to you this morning is uh, a deep experience of applying a number of these flexible working principles in practice um, in larger organizations. And then the last five years I've been working with uh, local SME businesses. So also very familiar with the challenges of when you don't have a large team, actually what's the impact of some of this? So um, very, very much on the application, how can we make things work point of view? And delighted to uh, be buddying up this morning with, with Pam Locke. So Pam, please introduce yourself. Thanks, Helen. Well, morning, everyone. Some of you might know me already because I know there's quite a few clients that have joined us. Um, but um, basically, I started out as an employment solicitor in the mid-90s. So I've seen the evolution from um, no rights for part-time workers to rights for part-time workers and then flexible working. And obviously, through the last year, we've seen a lot of changes with the impact of the COVID pandemic. And it's, it's led to quite a lot of dilemmas. Um, but uh, we see that through the employment law side, because we've got lock employment law. We also have our HR consultants working with clients to work their way through it. And then on the wellbeing side, we've also got HR medical specialists that are often working with clients, trying to work out whether there is a legal obligation um, to make reasonable adjustments, what the concerns are around flexible working or working from home, et cetera. So we see it all the way through uh, in terms of how businesses, you know, face challenges or deal with these uh, situations. Um, so with uh, no further ado, shall we crack on? Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say we're going to run it this morning in, in two halves, if you like. So Pam's going to kick us off uh, telling us the, the legal situation here and uh, some, some details around that so we know what we should be doing. Uh, what we might we might need to consider and then I will uh, go into some of the practicalities after that so yeah Pam please take it away. So the first thing we're going to look at really is the rise of hybrid working and flexible working and then we're going to look at your obligations in respect to flexible working and, and so you can understand what you can and cannot agree to um, and what you have to consider. Um, so Obviously, COVID-19 has probably been the major catalyst for the change in approach to working generally. Um, what we've got are clients that are quite confused out there about what the difference is. Hybrid working really is a choice for an employer to make. It's an approach that you can take. You might decide that you want to enable people to have a choice to work from home or in the office. You might also want to set down parameters around how often they should be in the office, how often they're allowed to work at home. That really is for you as an employer to determine. And then obviously you need to consult with staff and make sure you're pulling them with you. It's a tight recruitment market. You need to therefore probably be careful about not losing staff. The key thing uh, to ensure is to make sure that you've got your staff on you with this journey. They understand why you want to do this and also understand that actually from a legal perspective, at the moment, their contract is likely to contain a location as being their office for where their normal place of work is. So as an employer, your first thing you need to make sure is what do your contract say about location of work? Do not dive in and change that, OK, because I've got clients that have been doing that and that's not the way to operate because actually it can make, get you tied up in quite a few knots. Um, so the, th the first thing really I want to look at is what are your legal obligations? Because... The hybrid working, as I say, is really more a choice that you can make as an employer as to how you want to approach allowing your staff to operate and where to operate. But critically, there are some legal obligations which impact on that. So we're going to come on to look at that now when we're looking at the next slide and talking about the right to request flexible working. So this was a right that was created pre-2014. It was limited to certain people, um, mainly people that had dependents uh, and children. Uh, now it's extended to any employee that's got more than 26 weeks continuous employment so they can make a request. It's triggered by a written request, um, but you can get informal requests being made. So don't ignore informal requests, but I would encourage you to have a process and encourage staff to put in a written request. So once you get this written request, 
it triggers the statutory right um, and the obligations within it. The other thing to remember is flexible can be a whole range of things. It can be start and finish times, it can be working location, can be compressed in the week. And you may have seen a report this week about uh, a state agent in Marlebone who was um, subjected to a declaration that they'd done, they discriminated against um, one of their employees and they had an award made against them of £180,000. And that was for a failure to adjust the hours and allow somebody to work from home. So she wanted to finish at five instead of six to enable her to pick her children up from nursery and the employer did not um, permit that. So we'll come on to look at why that went wrong and how you can make sure you don't handle it incorrectly. Um, so on to the next slide, we're looking at how you deal with the request is important. You need to make sure you deal with it in a reasonable manner, and that's what the legislation requires. Um, you must um, make a decision and consider it and notify the outcome within a three month period from when you receive the request. You can extend that by agreement with the individual as well. So I am pushing you to follow a formal procedure. You don't actually have to publish flexible working policy if you have one. You can keep it in reserve if somebody asks and you say, well, here's the policy that we have. I would encourage you to use a prescribed form for the request so that you can get as much information as you need. And I'm happy to share that form with you if you want to um, you know, confirm after this that you'd like a copy of it. I can send you a copy of the form that we've got that we recommend you use. The other thing that's really important is you do need to arrange a meeting to discuss the request. Don't just do it by email. And you should also arrange a meeting if they do appeal the decision, which they've got a right to do as well. And you should also allow a companion. Now, remember, the companion is a workplace colleague or a trade union rep. It's not Auntie Mary or the dad coming in. It's basically a companion that's allowed by law. And, and again, the ACAS Code of Practice sets out what the requirements are in respect of companions. So moving on to how do you then handle the, these requests when they come in? And, and this is always a challenge for some employers, particularly where they have a number of people already working flexibly. So if you get another request coming through, um, how do you deal with multiple ones? Helen, could you move on to the next one? Sorry. Um, and that, that's, that's, that's always a bit of a challenge because then you're in a dilemma. What do you do? Well, actually, the ACAS code is quite clear on this. Each request should be considered on their own merits and in the order they are received and also taken into account the business at that time. So you, you've got a number of things you can bring into play. It's not a case of panic, what do we do? Because we've already granted it to these people. We can't then give it to the, we must do, we must give them flexible working. You can consider that application its own merit as well. Um, and you know, it might well be that you could consult with other employees that are already working flexibly to see if there's some flex that they could make to enable you to um, be able to agree to request. It does come with a caveat because you do need to keep in mind that as well as the flexible um, working request obligations, you also have discrimination law that sits in parallel with this. And quite often you will get flexible working requests for usually females that are carrying obligations. And you may also have a request that comes in for somebody who has a disability. So in both instances, um, you do need to um, think about whether legally you have an obligation, for example, under the Equality Act to allow somebody to work flexibly um, because that's a reasonable adjustment. Again, reasonable adjustments are determined by what is reasonable for the organisation. So the smaller organisation, the more challenging it is to accommodate a flexible working request, then it may well not be reasonable for the, that request to be granted. Um, a bigger organisation that's got more flexibility in terms of the team size, etc., then it may well be a more reasonable request and therefore you might have to comply with the request. And again, on the care and obligation side, going back to the case involving the estate agents, that is where they failed because um, the tribunal said, well, actually, you should have made the adjustment because it would have enabled um, the, the, the female employee to be able to pick up her children before the nursery closed. And it was indirect sex discrimination to impose a requirement for her to be forced to work full time and not to make, agree to the flexible working request. Um, and so in terms of the next slide, you'll see on there, there are basically three options, I suppose, you have available to you when you're thinking about what happens when you get a request. You can reject it, but be cautious. And we'll come on to that in a minute. You can agree alternative arrangements, perhaps with a trial period. 
and you can accept it with or without a trial period. And now I understand a lot of people are concerned that obviously with COVID, people will turn around and say, well, actually, you know, you were able to accommodate for working from home during the last um, 18 months or so. So you should be able to do it now. Well, to some extent, that's obviously true. And therefore, you, you do have to take that on board. But at the same time, we were forced into that situation because we had government um, guidance obligations to fulfill that meant that we had to do that moving forward we're now in a different um, set of circumstances um, so you can say that you you can agree to it or you can see well actually we had issues with it because we had concerns around how it's working um, and obviously I'll come on to look at that in terms of how you can reject the request um, in the next few slides the other thing to remember is if you do agree to the request it does become a permanent one and so you are varying the contract of employment on a permanent basis. So do think carefully about whether that's what you want to do. Um, Helen, just on to the next one then, and we'll look at the grounds for rejecting requests. And again, this is set down in, again in, a, in legislation. So if you do want to re re reject a request, you do need to include the reasons why, and you have one of eight or a number of grounds you can use and to rely on if you do want to reject the request. The key thing is you need to be able to look like you've considered and seriously considered the request and acted reasonably in rejecting it. So, you, you know, as you can see, there's quite a, a wide variety of grounds on which you can reject the request. The other thing you've got to think about as well is how does the employee react to it? And particularly if you've got a tight recruitment market, do you want to risk losing the employee? Now, obviously, make sure they've got the right to appeal. That gives you another opportunity to perhaps revisit it if you feel that's the right thing to do. Um, so if you do reject the request, then there is a possibility you could face claims. You might find the person resigns and bring, brings a constructive unfair dismissal claim, and they can do that if they've got more than two years service. They can bring an unlawful discrimination claim and they don't need to have any service. And the other thing they can also bring is a claim that there's been a breach of the flexible working legislation. And obviously they can only do that if They've got more than 26 weeks service and they've put in the request in writing, et cetera, and met the requirements under legislation. So you can see here there's a number of bases on which you could get caught out um, under the work flexible working legislation, um, including just not dealing with it timely. Um, or you might have rejected it incorrectly because it was based on the wrong information. Um, and as I say, the appeal gives you an opportunity to rectify that if you have. Um, you can think about asking ACAS to get involved in arbitrating, um, you know, in, in, in terms of if there is a, a dispute, but ACAS will only get involved if it doesn't have any potential for discrimination. So that's pretty limited in its scope. And there is a maximum award for the breach of flexible working legislation, which is up to eight weeks pay and it's got a cap on it. However, with unlawful discrimination, there is no cap and it does come down to how much they were earning and how much injury to feelings they have sustained. The £180,000 award that was made for the estate agent, quite a large chunk of that was earnings, but there was also an element of injury to feelings, which is purely based on the individual and, and how it has impacted on them. So just on a couple of cases um, that we've also seen um, in the past that are sort of more the leading cases, just to give you a couple of examples of how it can operate, You've got BA that got caught out because they thought they were being very reasonable and saying, well, you can't change your hours until you've done, um, you know, I think it was 2000 flying hours. Um, and in this case, the tribunal said, well, that's that's not fair. It's indirect discrimination. And Tesco's also got caught out um, because, again, they refused a request um, because they didn't deal with it in a timely manner. Um, and so, you know, in that instance, there wasn't a huge amount of money awarded, but you have got a disgruntled employee and a finding obviously against you, which is not helpful moving forward, particularly you want to get insurance cover uh, for tribunal claims in the future. So in terms of um, why this is all important, well, what we've got are we've got people that have become quite comfortable working from home. They enjoy it but they also recognise some of them that actually enables them to look after their children um, and not incur perhaps caring costs because they can pick the kids up from school and drop them off. So we're expecting quite a significant increase in flexible working requests coming in for people to either be able to change their hours to be able to pick their children up, drop them off, or perhaps look after elderly um, you know, parents that, that need care, um, but also people that are, are wanting to work uh, more at home rather than be in the office. 
Um, and the other thing that is likely to happen in the future, which the government has muted again, is they may well make flexible working a legal right anyway. In other words, it will become the default position so that if you've got a job and somebody wants to work flexibly, then they can work flexibly unless you can demonstrate it cannot be done flexibly. And you'd have to be able to show that you had a really good reason for that. Now, what's a bit fluid at the moment, as there's a lot of things, I have to be honest, in, in this climate, is what is a good reason. So we don't have information on that. And we haven't got concrete commitment to this. Um, but we have got a proposal also to remove the 26-week um, requirement so it become a day one right. And that could have an impact. Oh, Pam, I've just muted you by mistake. Right, I'm on back on. <laughs> so, yeah, the government's talking about also removing the 26 week requirement to have service um, before you can bring, bring a, a request. And what that would mean is that when you're actually in the recruitment process, you then need to be thinking about flexible working and actually this job, the job that you're advertising being um, available on a flexible basis. And that could have a big impact on businesses as well. I just also want to bring in another piece of legislation. Now, this has been around since 2000, and that's part-time workers' um, prevention of less favourable treatment regulations. Um, there is an increasing awareness of this, which may result also in how you are approaching um, your flexible workers and how you deal with them. And, and it's something that you need to be aware of. But basically, this these regulations require employers to treat part-time workers in, a, in the same way as they treat full-time workers. And that extends to really any interaction that you have with them, benefits, pay, leave, probation, training, etc., including things like, you know, social events as well that you organise. And I think it's quite challenging working remote workers and part-time workers as well. And so there's, there's, an, uh, there's an issue here, I think, about your managers, because I think your managers need to be trained on how they operate, because I can see what's going to happen is people that are coming into the office, perhaps working full time, may get treated in a particular way. Part time workers sitting at home may well feel that they are being left out and treated differently. So I think you, you could end up finding that these regulations come much more into play. So why is that important? Well, let's look at the next slide. Um, in terms of um, flexible working, as I said, most, most requests do come in from women. You've got a risk of getting combined sex discrimination claims and breach of the, the flexible working regulations. And on top of that, then also a breach of the part-time workers regulations if they feel that they are being treated differently and less favourably. And if that happens, the employee has got a statutory right to request a written statement as to why you're treating them differently. And you as an employer have to respond within 21 days. And, and if the employee can prove that there's less favourable treatment, then they can also be awarded compensation for the breach. And that includes compensation for injury to feelings. And again, like discriminate, any other discrimination claim, they don't have to be unemployed to bring that claim. So you could be dealing with a situation where you've got somebody actually in the workplace who's challenging the situation. And that, that's often quite difficult to manage. Um, both from an emotional perspective and from obviously a commercial perspective. And the tribunal also has the power to make a recommendation to the employer so that they must rectify the situation. So there's, there's, it's something that I think is really important just to be aware of because it's, a, it's been around since 2000, but we are beginning to see growing awareness, partly driven by internet, Googling searches and people feeling that they you know, have got rights and they're looking to find where they can exercise those rights. Helen, you're right. up next. It's me up next. Super. Thank you so much, Pam. Um, so I can see we've got one question in there. So let's hold that. We'll do all the questions at the end. And I think, you know, where we're going, we're going to have a good chance for that. So, yeah, as you've got questions, pop them in the chat box. Then we will come back and address those at the end. So just changing mode a little bit. I wanted to um, kick off. By, by starting to think actually about when we're getting into these situations where we've got a flexible working requests, whether that's part-time hours or, or different working locations, um, how we need to be to end up with the right solution for everybody and what mindset is most helpful. 
So as leaders of organisations, people, managers, supervisors, whoever we've got on, on the call today, um, wanted to share this little chart with us. So as you can see, we've got two axes. One is um, the level of self-respect we're, we're showing or respect to ourselves or our organisation. Um, and our, on the other axis, respect for others. Um, when we're in this bottom quadrant, we're, we're showing low respect for ourselves and our organisation and low respect for others, i.e. the employee who could be requesting, uh, making some flexible request. Um, we tend to end up in a lose-lose situation. You're putting your own business needs um, bottom of the pile, but you're also not trying to solve for them either. So it ends up in this lose-lose um, uh, situation which can be be seen as, as somewhat aggressive and it, it doesn't help the situation at all so we really don't want to be in that box um, on the other hand if we're actually downplaying our own needs we've got low self-respect for ourselves and our organization but actually very uh, considerate of the requests and, and this is probably the one I see actually often um, is this sense, goodness, we've had a request, we know there's law around it, we're not quite sure, um, and feel we have to, to accept that request as it's presented to us, um, which can end up in a lose-win situation. So the employee gets what they're looking for, um, and, and it works perfectly for them, but actually it doesn't work for the business, but you're putting up with it. Um, some of you might be thinking now, oh, I've got some situations we've had like that. Um, the other box we might end up here is where actually uh, we're putting the business and ourselves first um, and not respecting other people's needs, which is where it works for the business, but not for the, um, we're rejecting it when um, actually potentially there was another space. Um, this might be somewhere where you find yourself if you're dealing, um, I, I noticed some of the comments on your sign up forms was there's some more traditional thinking around um, in some of the leadership teams or, um, you know, if you've got somebody who's, who's very closed in the organisation and not wanting to um, flex at all, we can end up that it works for the organisation, you've got everybody where you want them working the hours, but actually not working for employees. And at the moment, as Pam said, it is an exceptionally tight recruitment market. You really want to be careful um, and, and focus very much on getting to this top box. Um, where we can find a solution that yes, works for the organization and yes, it works for the individual, um, which often does take some conversation. Um, and with so much of, of working with people, um, we don't want to get to the legal side. We, it's much better if we can do this in a really adult conversation way and have those face-to-face -face discussions, understand why, what people are wanting to achieve from their flexible working request, what, what problem are they looking to solve for? Um, you can position what you need to solve for and, and both work there. So at the very beginning of any process you're going through, any request you've got, um, I'd really encourage you to think, what mindset have you got? Are you coming at this in the win-win perspective? And also what mindset has your employee brought to the party here? Because you might actually need to have start with a conversation that says actually, position it that we need to find something that works for both of you and move them so you're both in that mindset or to put it more colloquially we need to get up to the I'm okay you're okay button here <laughs> um, that that's definitely the sweet spot so I would really recommend if you can um, get into that mindset with the person who's requesting it, it you're, you're going to have a much smoother and more um, successful outcome so uh, another thought I wanted to um, start sort of planting the seed with you here is actually the nature of problems. This is a very negative sounding slide here, but um, when um, it, it's a truism of life here um, is what comes around goes around. Um, and, and that happens for challenges or problems. So we call this the tap um, uh, the tap situation. So the first time uh, you get a sense that not everything is good, um, we call it a little tap on the shoulder. So um, maybe you've you've 
got one employee working some, or there were some situations maybe during furlough or during the last 18 months when you've everybody was working from home, that some things just weren't quite working smoothly for you. So you noticed it, there was a little hiccup maybe, that was a little tap on the shoulder, um, but you haven't actually addressed it because, hey, we'll all be back in the office, it'll be fine, but ooh, now people are we gonna get these requests in. So if we leave the tap unaddressed, what happens is you then get whacked over here by a plank of two by four. Um, it gets bigger, the consequence is bigger, there's more emotion involved and it just gets more difficult to solve, which in many situations, then people then shy away even more from getting into it because it's now got a bit bigger and a bit less pleasant. Um, but if we then still don't deal with it, what happens is you just get sideswiped by an Arctic lorry. And you've, the next thing you've got is a tribunal claim or whatever. You've got a resignation and then wait for it. Here's your unfair dismissal or failure to do this and that. So I share this um, because, as you will have worked out, the best thing to do is pick up an action when you get the tap, the first little nuance that there's something not right here. And that's the same if you've agreed a, a flexible working question and you've got a, a review period agreed. If something's not working out, why would you leave it to the end of the three month period? Why would you have an early conversation say, hmm, let's just think, um, how can we work around this bit? Because I've noticed this isn't quite working. And, and equally for the employee, early conversations are the key to success here. Um, and in all my experience, the ability to stay out of having um, fines or court cases or whatever is conversation, the right conversations at the right time um, so that things don't have a chance to build up. So what we've got and what we're all facing, I think, is this, this conundrum of how to balance um, the flexible working that so works for employees and it works for employers. And what we're going to look at here is, is look at it in three dimensions from a location perspective, from an hours perspective, and then also look at the opportunity and career opportunity and those kind of opportunities. So we'll start by looking at the location considerations. So from a, a business point of view, and I'm, I'm largely coming at this from a business point of view, because I want this um, situation to work for you. And actually, if it works for you, it also needs to work for the employees, because then you'll retain them. But we need to look at this from a, a couple of angles here. So if we start looking at what location is effective? When I say location, I'm really considering here the office location or the home location. Uh, I guess some organisations might have other satellite offices people could, could end up choosing to be at or potentially a, a sort of third party, um, uh, you know, desk share hot desk type scenario. But largely, I think the the, the locations people are considering are, are home or office. So first thing to consider, um, and I know this was a topic that came up in the, the questions you, you submitted earlier, was, was personal productivity. Where, which depends on so many things, doesn't it? What is the work? Um, where can that effectively be done? Can that effectively be done from home? Um, or, does it need to be done in the office? Um, for example, if, if part of somebody's role is sorting the mail, as in the physical mail, that's not going to be possible to be done from home. However, the likelihood is that isn't their full job. That's probably in amongst some other activities that they've got. And therefore, maybe they only need to, to, to sort it every other day or something like that. So, um, personal productivity some things need to be done in groups if you're being very creative um, you're brainstorming or you're physically using um, you know manufacturing or doing R&D there's things that just need to be done with the right um, kit around you um, but equally there's some very creative things where you just need peace and quiet and head down which could be done very effectively at home so really think the personal productivity, I think, is determined by the work. And remember that all jobs are made up of multiple different activities and the individual person. Some of us are massively motivated and energized by being around other people. Other people are much more effective on their own. So what might be productive for some person 
won't be for another. I think a big part of effectiveness, I suspect we haven't actually seen the full impact of yet, is the impact on learning. Um, I mean, generally speaking, um, a lot of organizations, and I certainly subscribe to the 70-20-10 um, philosophy on, on personal development, which would be 70% is done on the job, 20% uh, um, self-directed, you know, videos, um, online courses, podcasts, et cetera, and 10% and formal training. So if we're doing 70% on the job, a lot of that is, can be work with. Um, it can be a lot of, you know, what you pick up from hearing somebody, you know, at the desk next door to you or somebody just going, oh, come, let's work through this together. You haven't done it before. Now, these things can be done. Clearly, you can jump on a Zoom and do that. But are you thinking about doing that? Is that as natural as when you're next door to each other in the office? So I do think it's worth thinking through how, how you can make sure you, you maintain that, that learning opportunity. I think one dynamic to be aware of is, um, is the age dynamic somewhat. So younger people actually over the last um, 18 months on balance, I would say have struggled more with working from home. Um, oftentimes they have a less suitable um, space to work in but they want that connectivity and they're at the beginning of their careers and they need to learn from others. If you're more experienced people, are people who actually prefer to learn to, to work from home, then you've got the people who need to learn in the office and the people they're trying to learn from at home. So, so you need to work this one through. They can't or maybe your experienced people can't be at home as much as they'd like or in, in a way they, their role would enable them to if it didn't also include responsibilities to train others. Creativity and ideas, we bounce off um, one another. So yes, that can be done online. We've got whiteboards, but there's all sorts of um, new products that have come to en enable creativity online. Um, but there's also the informal, those water cooler moments, that informal space where you're just chewing stuff or you just walk past somebody and go, oh yeah. Um, so just be aware how, if, if people aren't in so much, how can you replicate that? Or if you've got people or departments coming in at different times, part of the week, they're in, part of the week, they're out. Are you being mindful about who's in with who to, to enable that creativity and idea generation to happen? And then effectiveness of team meetings. Um, I've done a whole nother webinar on this um, about doing hybrid meetings, but I think uh, everybody on that one agreed that it is the most challenging meeting to, to, to lead as a, as a leader is where you've got some of the group um, in a meeting and some dialing in, zooming in um, our teams or whatever. Um, really quite a tricky to make sure everybody has the same shared uh, experience and it has the same quality of experience. So if uh, I personally would highly recommend if possible, team meetings are either all online, everybody joins in from online, or ideally they're all in person. Um, and if they are hybrid, the recommendation is the facilitator of the meeting is actually remote because then they're experiencing it in the most challenging place and therefore far more likely to be inclusive with that. So just think about the team meetings. The other uh, team meetings also have a dynamic when we come to varying hours, but from a location point of view, which is where we're at today, just um, be, be mindful of the hybrid meeting is the most difficult to have a, a great experience for everybody. So that's on the effectiveness side. On the cost and suitability, um, just make sure you've got the right kit and what that cost implication would be and this might come into uh, some of those reasonableness um, considerations that, that Pam was telling us about earlier especially for smaller organization. Um, I work with a design um, agency so um, they have traditionally everybody's had desktops to, to have the right power um, the, the, the right processing power for the work that they do. Now when everybody was at home they just picked up desktops and screens and you know for, for a three month period that was right appropriate to pick it all up and reset it up at home and, and have a bootload of kit doing that um, 
if you're now flicking between, you know, three days in, two days out, that's not really so practical. Um, so uh, does that mean you're going to have to replace um, any remaining uh, desktops with laptops? Um, what about those roles? A lot of people are now using two screens. Um, so if you've provided two screens in the office, do they need two screens at home? Um, and there's a difference here between whether they need the two screens from a, a reasonable adjustment from a, a disability point of view or whether it's a choice and ease of use. Uh, but just think from a kit point of view, coming back and forth regularly multiple times in a week of lo changing location is one is very different to what we have been through. Um, that might have an impact on your cost basis. Lots of questions coming up around actually who's whose heating will come back to this in a minute what's the suitability of the furniture and the all the considerations about the workspace which people are in and this in particular has has impacted some of the, the young people who are in shared houses whether they've got enough broadband whether they've got you know their room's literally got a bed in it and there's no space for a desk um so just being aware of what is suitable because you still have a duty of care um, from a health and safety point of view um, and being perched on the side of a dressing table isn't the answer, nor is sitting on bed with a laptop on your lap. Um, so um, just be very mindful of that. Um, yeah, a hotbed of broadband, because quite frankly, most people have got it anyhow. So why would you as the employer? But is it good enough? Have they got it? Um, mobile signal. Um, some people have just live in areas where there's a disastrous mobile signal. And you can't get a hold of them. Um, is that okay? No, I would say, you know, they need to be contactable. How else can you manage that? Are there alternatives? Can you do VoIP, etc.? And the spaces, they're physically spaced to work. So lots of um, considerations to think through when you're going, can, is this the right combination, the right pattern uh, for this particular individual in their particular situation and what the business needs? So that's our location. Uh, now let's move on to um, timings, is that the hours people work. So if people are looking for flexible working by changing their hours, the two things I think as a business you need to be making sure you've got, one is coverage and the other is continuity. So you need to make sure you've got the right coverage for the role and for the business. Um, I've just illustrated one that request that in my experience comes up quite a lot is people are looking um, to, to work a school day if they want to drop off and pick up. And I know a lot of people have enjoyed the ability to do um, the school run during um, the last 18 months. But what this can do is, is mean that you end up with this funny bit because, you know, by the time you've dropped off and got back home, you can't really start till 9.30 or if you commuted to where you're going. You've got this funny half hour here not covered off. And then what's happening end of the day here and, and who is going to cover that time period. So you really need to look quite carefully. And I, I've had clients that are going, oh, you've got lots of flexibility. And then the owner goes, actually, I'm the only one in on a Thursday afternoon um, because everybody else is doing all these other things. So you need to look collectively at what's happening. Um, and individually. And it might be that you can't agree to both ends of the day. You can agree to one end of the day and somebody else is, is covering that morning slot and, and this person has to, and then they cover the afternoon slot or vice versa, uh, but make sure you've, you've got that coverage. Um, and oh, the other point on coverage actually is days of the week. Um, very popular if people that choose to work three days a week, they wanted to choose their Wednesday, Thursday, because uh, they can have a long weekend. Uh, so who's working Friday? Who is in the office on Friday? That is a big question. Do you need people in the office on Friday? So how are you going to arrange that? Um, because I'd suggest you probably, a number of people will need that coverage every day of the week. Um, maybe you run a fortnightly pattern so people take it in turn. Um, you've got to balance here the practicality of what you need and also the complexity of actually managing it. Continuity for me is a, is a huge thing. So. Um, across the week. So here I've got an example of a, a job share type arrangement. Um, somebody's in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, somebody else does Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Great, you've got coverage every day of the week. Perfect, happy with that. Another situation, it's not a job share, it's just somebody's uh, doing a, a job, they're the only person doing that job part-time. 
they've chosen they want to do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and they can have long Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday off. Mm. I don't like that one. I've always personally had a role, uh, a rule that you can't be out two days on the trot because if something comes in nine o'clock on Thursday morning that is part of this person's job, it's not going to get dealt with until Monday, which in most businesses I know is not fast enough. So with my rule that you're only out for one day before you're back in, um, then nothing's, everything can wait one day pretty much. Um, so, so work that through. I also have a role, a, a rule personally that people need to be in as much as they're out. So if, if the hours get less than about 18, 20, then I'm feeling people's minds are not really on work. Work is a very tiny part of their life. It probably doesn't get the priority you want it to have. So think about continuity and coverage. And then I just want to highlight a little bit on, on the benefits of part-time workers and, and job share arrangements. Um, so I, I, I often ask this question and very seldom does anybody tell me how they've got to the magic 40 hours a week for that specific job. Who actually allocates the number of hours each week per different activity within a job that adds up to the magic 40 hours a week? I would argue very few. Uh, we just go, it's about a full-time job. Great, it has to be done full-time. There are so many advantages um, for looking at part-time combinations or yes, maybe you have done the maths, it is a 40 hour week uh, active, uh, job, but who says the same person has to do these activities as these ones? Or if they do need that continuity throughout the whole, who says you can't split the, the scope the geography or the alphabet or however you work that one person has a smaller volume taking them through the whole uh, set of activities and another person has the other half of the volume so almost always I would say there is an ability to chunk down a job some of the massive benefits of doing that um, is you've got the opportunity of two people who could per if you need to scale up their hours temporarily do overtime um, or flex hours You've also got two people, so they're unlikely to resign at exactly the same time. So you've got some more continuity there. Great opportunity for saving money um, because you then get double the tax and NI free threshold before you have to pay employers tax and NI, which happens at about nine and a half thousand. Uh, so why don't you have two lots of that instead of one lot? So I just did a quick calculation actually preparing for this. If you had somebody on that minimum, uh, so the, it's a it's a salary where the salary is about twenty thousand. You would save three about three thousand four hundred a year on tax and NI if you had two part timers doing it rather than a full timer. So something to think about. You've got coverage for holidays. Just make sure they don't go on holiday together, and you've always got somebody in. And in my experience, you often get overqualified people um, because there are so few part time jobs out there that you can get a really super quality of of qualification and attitude. Um, so very worthwhile investing. So just some watch outs here. Um, compressed hours, uh, which Pam mentioned earlier. This is when effectively you squid your hours into say four days uh, and have Friday off, but you're still paid full time because you're working an extra paid um, three, three hours or whatever it works out to be on the other four days. My watch out here is, that sounds great, but if you've got other people who are giving you discretionary hours, i.e. working a bit longer than their um, contracted hours on those days and they're not having Friday off, that's not a good dynamic because basically they're working the same hours, one's getting Friday off um, and paid and one's working it. So just be careful of the dynamic there. Um, care responsibilities. A reason for many people having the flex working is for, for childcare or elder care, uh, even puppy care now maybe after lockdown. Um, but be conscious that that doesn't mean, and they don't, often don't think about this, you can't actually care and supervise and work at the same time. So if they want to get the children home after school and they want to do collect up, well, that is probably time that is unpaid because they're, uh, they're taking maybe 2.30 to 3.30 is, is an hour out and then they, they work again but actually who's supervising the child because if they're supervising as well their mind is not going to be fully on their work 
um, and there could be health and safety issues there. So just be careful and help people think through that on genuinely don't always think through how is this really going to work and just because we got by in the last 18 months doesn't mean that's how we're going to stay we need to make sure we're being fair to all um, from an engagement point of view um, think about the visibility um, for careers if somebody chooses to be in the office a lot more and somebody chooses to be or wants to be at home and remote a lot more how can you make sure of that impact? Um, it is a choice, um, but just be aware of that. Um, culture, there's a lot of cultural cues you get when you're in the office. You've got maybe the values around it, you've got your product, your brand, all of that is, is immersive experience for your team, which they're not getting at home. So just be conscious of that in your considerations and what you can see in terms of how people are. Um, when you see them all face to face and you get the, all the body language, it's probably a bit easier to see how people are feeling as the risks of burning out. But you can compensate for this, but make sure you are really checking in with people. If you're not seeing them regularly face to face, then make sure you're doing that on Zoom. And finally, watch out is what I call flexing the flex. It's quite easy to agree some, some parameters and some changes. And then the employee wants to flex them because it suits them. And, and then it might suit you and you ask them to flex them. So just watch out who's flexing more. And actually, is it now flex? Can you keep track of it all? And, and is it still fair and working? So just watch out because sometimes it can then get a bit muddled with lots of flexing of the flex. And just finally, a couple of hot potatoes here. Some of those questions I alluded to earlier around who, who pays for heating, who pays for whatever it might be, broadband, etc. I think one of the precursors to working out that one is actually whose choice is it? Are you requiring them to work there or are they choosing to? Um, and how does that balance with um, other costs they're not incurring? So I think as Pam set us up right at the beginning, this is very much for them to choose. And I think that gives us uh, as employers the ability to, to go, OK, you, you're choosing to do that. Um, we're providing a, a workplace where all these things are paid for and covered for you. Um, if you want to choose there, then that's your choice. Um, so be conscious, but you'll need to be consistent in how that's dealt with. And if you are paying for things, how are you going to, so if you're paying for furniture, for example, how are you going to get that back uh, if and when they leave? Because quite frankly, people will leave. That's what people do, generally speaking now at some stage. Um, so how are you going to unwind this? How are you going to make sure you're no longer paying for any broadband if you choose to do that? And um, and if you're choosing to buy furniture for them, if you're giving them choice, who else is going to want that? Or is it standard? So just think about how these are going to work. And for me, critically, how are you going to review it and when are you going to review it? Um, because people's lifestyles change and work situations, the business situation changes. So that's our rapid, quick trip through the content. Um, we are both uh, really conscious we've probably created as many questions as we've answered. Um, so um, do feel free to book a, a, a free consultation with us um, afterwards. Um, We've got a feedback form that will get dropped. We'll put a link into the chat box for you, um, which where you can just register that you'd like to connect with us. Um, Pam, we've actually just added a tick box for if people would like your flexible working request form. Um, so people could just tick that for you. Um, the other thing I wanted to let you know is if, if you have people who are needing to improve their people management skills, their team engagement skills. Um, we are leading a, a workshop um, later on this month in aid of uh, children with cancer uh, in the UK to do it. So we're doing a charity workshop. It's hundred pounds for a three hour workshop. All of that money goes to charity to give lots of tips and tricks and, and um, techniques for people to really engage and enthuse their team. So those are my details. And Pam, I'll just hand over to you and then we'll get into questions. Helen, it might just be worth picking up on a couple of things that are maybe pertinent as well, which is data protection and health and safety requirements. You talked about the duty of care. And I think what's yep. happened over the last 18 months 
is that a lot of people have put in place temporary measures to deal with both data protection and the, um, the health and safety requirements. And I think moving forward, you're going to see a change in the regulation of that. So if you are putting more permanent arrangements in place, these are things that you really need to give more serious consideration to, and they might also impact on how you make a decision as to whether you grant a flexible working request or indeed whether you want to put in place a hybrid um, arrangement. So one of the key things, obviously, is the health and safety aspects of working at home. We do DSE um, tests to make sure that the setup is correct. You need to be thinking about making sure that you do some sort of physical check. Now, you could do that by video link and we can do okay, that sale for you. But also you could do that by actually saying we want to come and check your home environment. Now, a lot of people might think, oh, I don't want somebody coming into my house. But actually, you're legally obliged to make sure you look after somebody's health and safety. And therefore, I think it's a reasonable request to say that you do need to make sure that it's physically safe. Um, because otherwise you could face yourself, um, you know, getting complaints made to HSE, health and safety executive, or um, at a later stage, a personal injury claim. Now, some organisations are going to quite extreme lengths. Namira Bank has said that they are actually, in order to look after the care and the care actor for their employees, they are banning smoking during working hours and in somebody's home. But they said they can't, they won't monitor that. So, but I mean, I think that's probably going too extreme but you do have an obligation to look after their health and safety. So think about that very carefully. And that's not just physical safety, that's mental well-being as well. So you need to think about how you're engaging and maintaining contact with them. And then the other aspect is data protection. Um, because if you are not buying the equipment, they own the equipment, you need to make sure that you've got policies, contractual obligations in place to make sure that if they do leave your employment, that that information is yours and it will be returned to you. And it may be that you want to make sure that you can have some personal equipment um, returned to the office to be, um, you know, to have information erased from it. So you do need to think through what the implications are of you making a decision. You're not going to finance equipment at home. Because, again, you've got this issue around, is it, you know, health and safety? Is it, is it ergonomically safe, et cetera, as well? But on the, you know, computer equipment side, you need to make sure you maintain control over information and it's not shared in a way that would be breaching um, the Data Protection Act as well. So there's lots of implications. Obviously, if you've not got a home working policy in place, then it's absolutely critical you get that. And it picks up on all these different aspects. Um, but also thinking ahead now... We're no longer in this temporary emergency situation. You now need to think about firming up on what your policies and approaches are. And I think that is such a key thing for, for us, uh, for, for the business owners and leaders, but also the uh, the employees to get get that point across is that what, what was working, what, what has happened in the last 18 months has been this emergency situation. And now actually this all needs to be properly done now and properly considered and properly thought through. We have got a couple of questions come in, so thank you. So Mark, um, are there contractual opt-out arrangements for some of these, similar to the 48 hour working time directive? Um, Pam, I'm gonna put that over to you. I think you're talking about then the flexible working regulations, part-time yeah. working regulations, et cetera. No, there's no, there's no opt-out. No opt-out. No, no. That's simple. Um, Liz, so question here, part-time versus full-time discrimination around things like events. Um, so you're thinking like socials and that side of things, uh, therefore less benefits would be fair. I, if I ask that from my practical point of view, uh, I think this, these types of things are all around the engagement of the employee, first and foremost for me in terms of the effectiveness. Um, so a lot of this is just around thinking and planning, um, which actually might involve planning the patterns you would agree to so that you make sure there is always a window of overlap that you can get everybody together on a call, at least if not face to face, that the, the part time schedules mean there is a half day sometime in the week where everybody is in um, or for the socials and things that you move it around. So sometimes it's on a Tuesday for the Monday to Wednesday people, and sometimes it's on a, a Thursday, um, maybe from the hybridness. Sometimes there's an online social and sometimes there's a um, in-person social. So mixing it up 
Um, I doubt, I mean, Pam, jump in here if, if we'd have to be specifically proportional to the hours. But um, I, 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 I think yeah, that I intent think... is a large part of it. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I mean, there are some benefits which you can look at prorating, but I mean, if it's just socials, it's, it's sort of one of these things that often gets missed. And it's one, of, it's one of the things that somebody will target if they're unhappy and they're feeling, you know, that they're not getting treated properly. So they'll say, well, you know, I didn't get invited to that or you've had it on this Thursday and I don't work on a Thursday. So you're absolutely right. It's mixing it up a bit and just thinking about it. Yeah. Um, there are some practical things like if so I, I, I definitely eschewed the benefits of part time working that there. there are some watch outs. You know, if you've got two people and they both have a they need to have a mobile phone to do their role, that probably is two mobile phones, not one. And if they're really going to pass it over from one to the other, which probably has got a COVID issue about it anyhow. So, the, so there will be some double up costs there potentially as well. Um, it doesn't be easy for an employee to get a job and then day one to request change the package for themselves what is protecting the employer um they could request the change but it's a request that people have a right to make the request they don't have a right to have that request agreed so if you were very clear that this was the required working pattern um then that's your protection especially as a small business um, if you've considered the other elements and you've got those, um, the list that Pam showed in terms of the reasons for why, why not. Um, but I think, you know, if, if you've got a number of part timers there and you actually need a full time to go across and you're advertising it as such, then you've got a good justification there because you, you can explain why it has to be and why you were looking for that. Pam, just, would you add anything to that? Yeah, yeah, just to reiterate, at the moment, you need to have 26 weeks service. Um, to make a yeah. request unless you're making a request to uh, make a reasonable adjustment um, so you're putting in the request because actually you want the job um, but actually you're not able to work five days a week because you've got um, you suffer from depression um, now at that point obviously um, you're then on notice that they are saying they've got a disability you don't know for definite they have they're saying they have so you've got some information that indicates that and therefore, what they're actually asking you to do is make a reasonable adjustment. So you then need to think about whether you could make that reasonable adjustment. So that's when you need to go through the consideration as to whether it's something that's reasonable for your organisation. I often get asked, can I ask the question before I make an offer as to whether somebody's got a medical condition um, that could affect their performance? The answer is no, you're not allowed to anymore. Um, but what you can do, obviously, is then you're on notice that they've got a condition, you then consider it carefully and, and consider what's a reasonable adjustment and it may well be that you can't agree to the, the change so at the moment it's either the 26 weeks or it's going to be something that they could argue would be some form of discrimination for you to give it some consideration from day one but the government is likely to be changing that um, and I'm not sure whether the government has put that out with the hope that employers will start to approach things more flexibly but I do anticipate at some point maybe the next six to 12 months we might start seeing the government putting through some legislation to make it a day one right um, and, it, and you know I, I've had that myself but I've had an employee that's you know it's, it's clearly um, a full-time job and I've made it very clear we need for various reasons continuity blah 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 it's a full-time job and then we're going through the recruitment process and they've turned around and said well actually I need two days at home because I've got to pick up my kids from school and I've got to, you know, drop them off in the morning. So I want to be at home at those hours. And exactly what Helen said, obviously, the implication was that they were going to be looking after their children while they were trying to also do the job. And, and that's not going to work. It's not fair on anybody, including the children, but also the individual and the employer. So and it's having that conversation to say that doesn't seem to work. And again, they hadn't thought about it. So um, where's, yeah. where's the line with that, though? Because effectively, that's discrimination because you're saying because they have children and they've got to do childcare. Well, it's not it's not automatically discrimination that's unlawful because it's indirect. Potentially, it's indirect discrimination because I've applied a requirement that I feel the job needs to be done full time. Um, they would then say, well, actually, I think that's indirectly discriminating against me because I'm a woman and I've got the you know more women have caring responsibilities than men. Mm -hmm. And therefore, and I would be able to objectively justify that. So you can objectively justify certain forms of discrimination. Um, not direct discrimination generally, but indirect discrimination you can. So you basically have to put forward an explanation as to why it wouldn't work. So that's, that's why it's important to seriously consider requests, 
you know, and be able to then respond. And obviously Helen's given you some suggestions mm. about things that you can think about to go back and respond with it. Thank you. Great. So if um, if you've got other questions, I notice we're at top of the hour now. Um, so any other questions, please do save that. Book a one-to-one -one with Pam or myself.